Yeah, you And it wasn't an AI photo. No, no. He's, uh, he's one of the people that talks about like, the strength of the mind and like, the body mind connection and whatnot. Well, where, where I'm, I'm thinking from at, at about the same time that I was studying 19th century philosophy, I also had an introduction to sociology course. Uh, and in fact, this was the mandatory book, one of them for the course. Um, and I was so fascinated by this book that I went and bought uh, the other one, which is even more famous, and that's this one, uh, The Social Construction of Reality. Um, the more famous one was written not only by Peter Berger, but also Thomas Lutton, who died not too long after that. Uh, Peter Berger has also died, I noticed that he died uh, in 2017. But the advantage of this, these are Hege this is a Hegelian view, right? And they say this, this is Hegel, so this is an updated interpretation of what's going on in this master-servant situation here, right? And what you've got is the puzzle over how society creates reality, the social construction of reality. I think I mentioned one of the books on, on uh, the phenomenology uh, by uh, 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 Pink Ard was um, called The Sociality of Reason, right? So the idea that what we think of as knowledge, what we think of as logic, what we think of as reason is the social dialectical process that creates what we think is knowledge uh, but it's constantly in flux. We're constantly learning more, right? Uh, society is changing. What's right? Uh, what's move? You know, what's going on uh, at the moment when we're talking about identity? Remember, I I think I started the class mentioning the song, um, uh, "What Was I Made For?" Right? You know, you know, is that a current crisis uh, that we're we're facing? Um, well, the, the difficulty is in ideas being new, and when they're new, Hegel says they're like concrete. You take, uh, you think, what, how's the metaphor of concrete work? Well, I, I build a mold, and I pour wet concrete into this mold, so the idea as I'm creating it is brand new, and it's very flexible, I can mold it, right? But once I take the frame off and I let this mold dry uh, now, it becomes a rock. I mean, the, the Romans invented this stuff, uh, but nonetheless, and, and in fact I believe uh, someone in the uh, recently said that the most uh, used material apart from water uh, on the earth is concrete. I don't know if that's true or not, I don't know how you would figure that out. But in any case, um, we as a society create a new idea and then that idea becomes like a rock and now it's it's there i remember when the concept of a meme was first invented uh, it was on page 195 in uh, richard dawkins book the self uh, the self-conscious gene no what, what did he call it the self oh how can i forget the name of that um, I remember the page. Selfish, the selfish gene. So this is actually that's an old book already. I have a copy of the 30th anniversary as well. Uh, but so um, when was that the original book published? Does it say down here? So this is 2006, but it was originally in the 90s. Had to be 30 years. Well, 30 years. Can't remember. But he mentions somebody ought to come up with a meme. 
an, an expre expression instead of the gene, we ought to have a meme. And that would be like a meaningful element in our language or our music or whatever that has a particular meaning. And it would be like a gene. You know, a gene is, you know, you put a bunch of genes together and you have a double helix or, or whatever, right? You know, but you put a bunch of memes together and you get whatever. But the point he also made was that memes are alive. You think about it, what, what is life? Well, life is anything that has a particular uh, uh, shape or process that's, that's identifiable as that item. And it is constantly taking in energy and it's reproducing itself. And you think, well, okay, so all kinds of things fit into that, you know, cells, etc. But would we call a meme that? You know, ba 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 bum. You know, well, we all know that meme. You know, it's the fate motif from Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. And I just took that replicated uh, uh, system, bum 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 bum, right? And using the energy that I like, a, it's like a parasite on me, right? And took that energy from me and reproduced itself to spread itself just like a virus among everyone else, right? You know, that could hear me, right? Um, so literally, he thinks of memes as alive and reproducing themselves. So, so that's pretty interesting. Um, and, and by the way, uh, Susan Blackmore, who was one of Richard Dawkins' students, uh, wrote a book then called The Meme Machine. where she took this idea from her teacher uh, and, and, and ran with it and created this whole concept, right? Now, of course, we all know what memes are. We talk about them probably, you know, in lots of different venues. But we are carriers. We're machines that receive these memes and literally, over history, individuals have been so overcome by the memes that they have been infested with, or infected with, that they quit being interested in passing on their genes, because instead they're primarily concerned with passing on their memes. If you think about it, that's just hilarious. You know, it describes exactly monks and nuns that take the vow of celibacy, whether they do it or not, that's interesting, but you know, they're they're literally trying to not procreate themselves biologically, but they focus instead on carrying on receiving the means through prayers and, and everything and passing them on to others. So meme machines, fascinating, fascinating topic. Meme is an example of an idea that clearly was invented at a certain place, page 195, the selfish gene got picked up by others and the concrete you can see it being poured into the mold and the dried and now everybody knows this concept and uses it at least in the English speaking world right uh, so that's an example of how society creates reality because these are real to us now uh, and if you think about it it's the easiest thing to think about is, for example, money. What's the value of money? Frankly, I haven't seen money for 20 or 30 years. Uh, you know, the, ever since McDonald's started taking credit cards, there was no longer any need for me to actually see money. Uh, instead, it's credit cards and everything's electronic and who knows, right? Um, but if you think about it, that's a perfect example of another uh, idea, somebody came up with it. In history, uh, various types of money. Uh, when did the gold standard go away, right? You know, there's all kinds of historical elements about how this particular concrete block has been nibbled away by society changing the shape of these, these ideas. So, when we're talking about how do we know what an object is, notice that these objects for us 
are in our consciousness. They're social, so they're shared through our inner social discourse as we argue over them. Is, is having an abortion a right that a woman should have? Is it a right that a man should have? Well, that's dumb, right? Uh, and if you think about it, why would that be dumb? Well, because there's something that the concrete sits on that is reality that refuses to be changed even by our social construction uh, attempts, right? Uh, a, a perfect example of this, as I, I was experiencing learning all of this, there was also a feminist movement uh, in our country uh, that I even went to a couple occasions where I saw people giving lectures and talking about burning your bras and things and my wife, well she wasn't my wife yet, but she said, I wouldn't burn it, I need it. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, that's one of those things, right? Um, that the feminist, you know, went through stages, right? We, we even say the first wave of feminism was this wave where they were fighting for their rights and so on. And that gave them the vote and property rights and things of that sort. And so that goes back to about the same time uh, that you had uh, uh, prohibition, because that was part of what they were arguing for to get rid of alcohol and so on. So that first wave of feminism was located there, right? But the second wave was a wave that I was involved with in, in school in, this, in the 60, late 60s, 70s, right? And that was where they wanted to break through this glass ceiling. Women want to be able to do what men do and go out and do all the jobs and take all the, the, the money and you know, get all the CEO positions and so on, right? You know, so they wanted to go do that, and so, oh, okay, it changes a lot of things in our society. Should they become GIs? Should they be uh, military on the front line and, and be fighting uh, instead of the typical, at the time, uh, position that most women that I knew were in, were in like a linguistic, uh, you know, in my MOS, or, you know, they were in the medical a profession, things of that sort. They might have been in supply, but they usually weren't cast in the role of being out there pumping it with an 80 pound rocket and, and all their equipment, right? They wanted to change all that. In fact, some women have actually amazingly done fantastic uh, that way. But there's a biological problem with that. Women are different than men. There are, now, granted, there's overlaps. There are some women that are clearly... There's outliers. Yeah, 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 we could do the, the, the bell curve is, thing and put Steven, them... Steven Pinkerton, who wrote the book, Outliers? Is it that Malcolm Gladwell? Malcolm Gladwell, yeah. yeah. Um, but you get the idea that, yeah, of course we can have some individuals that are way on, on this tail of the, the bell curve, that beat the crap out of all of these males that are in the over, you know, they're over in this side of the bell curve. You know, you've got overlapping bell curves, right? Um, well, what makes that the case? Well, estrogen, you know, uh, testosterone. Uh, uh, interesting thing is, is uh, a fetus in the womb at six weeks goes through a biological change. And that change depends on several factors. One is, is the fetus XX, which would make it a female, right? Or is it XY, which would make it a male? Well, if it's XY and there's sufficient testosterone in the mother's system, that fetus suddenly has a shift where the corpus callosum splits and that fetus's brain will now be male, right? Uh, if it's an XX, it takes more testosterone in the mother's system for that to happen. But it can. You can have some XX fetuses switch and have the brain split. Those will be women who appear to be women but have male brains. The males, that the mothers don't have enough testosterone so that the brain doesn't split, 
will look male but have female brains. And does that actually change their behavior? You bet it does. And so you end up with a range of possibilities associated with individuals depending on the circumstances that their mother had at that particular moment in their fetal gestation, right? Uh, so there's biological characteristics associated with us that the feminist movement in the second wave were trying to fight against 